Hey everybody, we are going to start talking about ICD-10. Hopefully you watched that other additional video over insurance. Um, it was just another perspective on Medicare and Medicaid and it did talk about private insurance. So be sure you've leave, uh, gone through that. It will be um, definitely something that you'll need to know on the administrative uh, administrative assisting end of your, med uh, your medical assistant program. So let's get started with ICD-10. Um, this is going to talk to you a little bit about, or I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about ICD-9 and ICD-10. ICD-9 is a, was the coding that we did up until about 2013 through 2014. Um, it became non-optional once October 10, 2013 um, passed. It was October the October, October the, of that year, um, ICD-10 went into effect. I wanted to give you a little um, history on both of them just simply because it was such a big change for um, for providers and for people who've been in healthcare a long time. So um, document, the reason why we do this, we do it either we either document it manually, hopefully it's on an, e an EHR for you guys or an electronic medical record for you, an EMR, uh, EHR, electronic health record, electronic medical record. Hopefully they um, have a lookup for you. Some of them still have the old ICD-9 versus ICD-10 lookup for you. But you want to be sure that um, you're aware of that. Know that every year there are draft guidelines and coding and reporting, coding and reporting changes related to uh, ICD-10. So you want to be sure that you stay on top of that. Um, what happens um, if we do not use that ICD-10 coding? We do not. The doctor or the provider does not get paid. So we have to be sure that we prepare and we understand. That's why I made you guys look up the top 50 codes. We looked up CPT and HCPC or HCPCS codes because those are all very important. ICD-10 codes are what we have to look up or what we bill with. What 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 money is tied to? That's the first thing and the biggest portion of what money to our provider or our facility is tied to. And let me tell you, they want to be sure things are coded appropriately and that they're coded in the correct order. And we're going to look at an ICD-10 book so that you can, um, ne in the next video, so that you can be kind of prepared and understand what goes along with trying to look things up in a book. Um, hopefully I can make it clear on our overhead, but just so that I can show you. And then we'll do some practice run-throughs with coding. Um, I'll give you kind of a coding um, uh, template or a coding sheet, and then you'll be able to kind of look those up to see which, how you would code it. So ICD to ICD nine to ten. So um, the um, so these are kind of backwards, but ICD nine is the first, and ICD ten is the second. And I tell you what, let me go back, and I will just change that to nine and ten. That way it makes more sense to you. It's really hard to find good PowerPoints, and I'll be honest with you, that have them in the correct order anymore. Most people are comparing old to new. So there are multiple chapters in each book. Um, and the coding, as you can see, infectious and uh, parasitic diseases in ICD-9 were 001 to 139. Now, depending on what disease it is, it would be an A00 to B99. Um, and so the chapters have changed and their chapters coincide. They just have changed the actual coding. Also, there's a lot more codes in ICD-10 than there were in ICD-9. So you can see the differences in the parallels. Um, they're basically there based on neutral, on what's going on with them. So neoplasm would be cancer diseases of blood and blood forming organs. So we're going to be more concerned with the chapters on the right. Um, you could just see kind of how they coincided with the old chapters. Um, and so see there's a, a ton of chapters that we will go through. Um, so this is really the slide I want you to, to, to show you guys so that you can see the comparison and the changes that were made just a few years ago. Um, ICD-9 had 17 chapters, ICD-10 has 21. Um, there were E and V codes for supplemental classifications. E and V codes are, e and v codes are um, E codes were related to falls and different kinds of traumatic issues. V codes were related to therapy and wound care and things like that. 
Those have gone by the wayside and now all of the codes are alphanumeric, uh, which means they have a, a letter first and then numbers to follow. Um, you, before sensory organ conditions and the nervous system were all one chapter, now they're separate. So everything, um, the, the anything related to senses, so maybe you had an eye injury, it would have been over under nervous system. Now that's going to be in a separate chapter under sensory organs. Um, all of the, all of ICD-10 uses current terminology, and that's something that changes frequently in each um, chapter, and that's why that medical terminology is so important that we learn it because of how it's listed in the ICD-10 um, codebook. It is specific to medical ter current medical terminology that's used worldwide. ICD-9 is no longer, it's obsolete completely. Um, Injuries are done by, they used to be done by type. So if it was a laceration, it was under laceration. If it was a burn, it was under burns. Now the injuries are grouped by site and then type. So we would do injury to the um, lower right leg and they are left and right specific. And then we would do abrasion. It would be a separate code. Um, Complications uh, of Medicare, uh, of, of medical care were in chapter one, and now uh, complications have been categorized to procedure specific body system chapters. So in the, each body system chapter, there will be a procedure specific code. Um, before there was a maximum of five characteristics, now there's a maximum of seven. Sometimes there's an X, a letter for a placeholder, um, sometimes not. Now we have food, full code titles and code extenders that are for uh, to make it more specific and um, also for whichever side of the body it is, for locate specifics for location and sides of the body. Um, once again, there were three to five characters with ICD-9. Now there are a maximum of seven codes, as few as three, but as, as many as seven. Um, the first character, Previously, all of, in ICD-9, all of the codes started with a number with the exception of the E and V codes. Now, all coding, all ICD-10 codes start with a letter. Um, there are two to five numeric, there were two to five numeric ca characters. All letters except the U codes are first. Um, you use a decimal with um, after the third um numeric alphanumeric code in ICD-10. Now here's the difference. Before, and this one when I said there were many, many more codes than there were before, previously there were 13,000 codes related to healthcare with the ICD-9. Now there are more than 72,000 codes. So just, you know, just be aware that there, and there are codes that are added every year. So you have to be sure that um, you understand what you're looking for in the coding book or when you're looking it up. And I'm gonna tell you now, one of the codes that you do not, you wanna do your very best not to use is an NOS code, not otherwise specified. There are times you will have to use it, but pretty much if you use a code that says um, hypertension, not elsewhere, NOS, not, uh, not otherwise specified, basically you're not going to get the, the provider's not going to get paid for that so remember that these codes are based on what what the what the facility you're working at is getting paid for your visit you want to make sure they get paid because if they don't get paid eventually you won't get paid okay so this is an example of a um, icd-10 code so i-25 is chronic heart disease and then the 701 specifies um, that the patient has had arthrosclerosis with a bypass graft and complication and, and complications related to that. So that means they had coronary heart disease with a bypass and they had complications with that bypass. Now, what it would have said would be arteriosclerosis of coronary bypass unspecified with angina, angina pectoralis with documented spasms. What that means is someone had occluded or occluded um, arteries, they had a bypass, and then they continued to have chest pain and um, spasms to the chest wall afterwards. So that's, like I said, that is an example of what a 9CD10 code looks like and what you're going to have to know. Once again, I can't stress to you how important that medical terminology is and you understanding medical terminology fully. Um, 
so for reporting purposes only, codes are uh, presume are uh, permissible in not categories or so in in subcategories. The seventh character is applicable when required. Sometimes it has an X in that place. Um, so like poisoning, adverse re adverse effects, and under diagnosing codes, those are your T codes. Um, they may need a placeholder of an X. Sometimes there will be um, an X before a, a subsequent, a first, or a sequela, and we'll talk about those later, related to um, coding. The seventh character must always be the seventh character in the data. There must always be a seventh character in the data field. Like I said, sometimes it's an X. Um, so just to be sure that you know and you understand and that you choose the right code. The great thing about, um, the really great thing about electronic health records is you don't have to look up every code. Most of the time you can drop down and you can, by knowing what the actual doctor diagnosis is, if he says um, benign hypertension, then you can look up the specific benign hypertension code based on what he has told you and it'll just be in a drop down box. You may have to ask a couple questions based on documentation to be sure that you get the correct one. NEC still represents not elsewhere classified if NOS is not otherwise specified. And um, once again, we want to be really careful about using those two codes. Anything with that afterwards, those NEC and NOS codes, because generally payment is not available and that's in a tabular there's a tabular list of those available in the book and i will i promise like i said after we go through this we're going to talk i'm going to show you what the icd-10 coding book looks like and how we go through and we utilize it um, it's very important like i said that you understand how important coding is to your job whether you're working front office or back office because it is based on a the insurance company know what's wrong, knowing or the, whoever the payer is knowing what's going on with the patient, but also based on connections with medications, making sure that if someone has hypertension, they and they have a, they have a blood pressure medicine, they've got to have a hypertension code attached to it. If they have fluid retention, they have to have a code related to it. So you just have to make sure that your codes connect to your medications as well as to your um, to your diagnosis for payment but also related to payment for medications um, it's really important and we'll talk when we talk about prior authorizations and referrals and things like that in the next week um, how important coding is related to those prior authorizations and and, um, and referrals there it's very important to have the correct um, coding for those things, especially for insurance companies to approve those. So general coding guidelines, um, locating a code, um, you locate a code in the alphabetical index and we will look at that and you verify the code in the tabular list. So we'll look at that in the book of what the uh, alphabetical index is along with the tabular list because sometimes when you look up one code and then you open it up to that specific page, then it's going to give you other things that go along with it. Sometimes it's signs and symptoms. Sometimes it's related conditions. Sometimes it tells you that cannot be the, the primary code you, or you must have additional um, diagnosis related to that. So you want to be sure that you go to the tabular portion so that you can, so that you can uh, be sure that you have um, the right information. Now, previously with ICD-9 uh, ICD coding, if some, we, we listed what the patient complaint was first. Now we list what's wrong with the patient. So if a patient comes in with um, cough and congestion, we're not going to list cough and congestion because that is a sign and a symptom. We're not going to list that first. We're going to list what the actual diagnosis was. So if, when the doctor saw them, they were diagnosed with bronchitis, we're going to list bronchitis first, and then we're going to list the, the ICD-10 code for cough, and then we're going to list the ICD-10 code for congestion. And those are generally Z codes. Um, sometimes they're A and T codes, but we want to be sure. Um, also, we have, there are non-compliance codes we, that we have to list if a patient doesn't take their medication appropriately and they have repeated visits for a condition. And here's why. Um, Medicare, Medicaid, and insurance look at how often a patient comes to see you. So 
if a patient has a new diagnosis, they expect the patient to follow up a few times to, for re medication regulation or for um, just education or whatever purposes. But then they get after about six months, they expect you to have that under control. And if it's hypertension, the patient really should have education. They should be on the right meds. They should be regulated out and should just kind of be coming to see you once a year for hypertension. So they're also seeing what's going on with that patient if they continue to come in once a month for blood pressure it could be because they're non-compliant with their medication and you would have to list that or they're non-compliant with their diet you would have to list the code for non-compliance with diet if they're a diabetic um, those are reasons that are very important and that you also have coded the education portion and document the education portion so that um, the patient looks like it's being followed appropriately one of the things you never want to have to do is to have to sit down with a surveyor who is looking through your charts from an insurance company or from Medicare or Medicaid, and you haven't documented when a patient comes in, in the, under visit three and they're non-compliant with their diet and you didn't document that you did education on an 1800 calorie ADA diet and you gave them um, a meal plan. You want to document that in the chart because that may be two years later and you're not going to remember that you did that. So just be sure that you're not just based on your doc, you have the coding that backs up the documentation. Um, also, whenever it's something related to a side, whether it's a stroke that affects the left side or it is a broken arm on the right, the right radial, um, the right radius is broken, you want to be sure that you are coding right side or left side. Um, and you want to be sure that the, that everything is listed appropriately. Okay, so diagnostic coding and report uh, diagnostic coding and, and outpatient kind of thing. So um, we're going to you're going to be doing a lot of outpatient kind of coding. So you have to be sure that you're choosing the right codings that you list um, the list select the uh, uh, I'm sorry selection of the first listed diagnosis. So you're going to uh, use coding conventions for ICD-10 as well as general disease. Specific guidelines or specific guidelines that go over outpatient uh, for outpatient or home health or um, um, hospital. And you're going to do the um, ac you're going to accurately need to report that based on what the patient is there. You're going to be sure that you use that you are using the correct terminology. You don't want to code someone with pneumonia um, and, the, and the bacteria, you have to choose a bacteria that's the, that is pneumonia, whichever pneumonia that it is. So maybe you chose uh, MRSA and it was actually pseudomonas related pneumonia. So you want to make sure that all of the appropriate codes are choosing, are, uh, you're choosing the cor correct code at all times and that you are using all of the placeholders that are necessary. So um, here's some differences in coding. So before non-dependent alcohol abuse, that would mean someone who is a binge drinker, um, that used to be 305.0. Now there's alcohol abuse with intoxication, alcohol abuse with intoxication, but it's uncomplicated. Basically, they were brought into the emergency room um, and they were intoxicated, but they didn't have injury or it was not something they frequently did. There's alcohol, alcohol abuse with intoxication related to delirium, meaning, meaning they are having hallucinations or they're confused or they can't follow direction. And then there's alcohol abuse, intoxication, unspecified. We want to try to not use unspecified unless we absolutely have to. As you can see, there are six places there because the first one has five placeholders and then there are six. Now, at, at times, there may be, a, you may have to place an X in the seventh placeholder or in the sixth placeholder because you have a seventh digit. When you open to the tabular section, and I'll show, we, when we look at that, it'll make more sense. It will tell you if you need to have an X in the sixth placeholder. Oh, sorry. So Y90 is evidence of alcohol involvement determined by blood alcohol level. You have to code first any association with alcohol. So what you would have to code first is you would have to code one of these F, um, F10 codes. You would have to code an F10 code first, and then you would code a Y90 code based on what their blood alcohol level was. So um, 
you know, that, like I said, that's one of those things that we, they may have come into your, say you're working in the emergency room scribing for a doctor. They, they may have come in by ambulance from a car accident and one of the codes you had, they're there because of alcohol, an alcohol related issue. Well, they're there because you're doing their blood alcohol level. But that's not the reason that they actually came in. That's not the that's not the diagnosis for why they are are there to get their blood alcohol level checked. So you would do the blood out the F10 code, and then you would do the Y90 code following. Okay, so we're going to do some of these. Um, we're going to look at this progress note. Miss um, Smith is an 87 year old male. Uh, Mr. Smith is an 87 year old male who presents for follow-up for chronic kidney disease, stage three. It appears that he developed a sudden onset of shortness of breath. After seeing me, he was hospitalized for a few days with congestive heart failure, exacerbation, and pneumonia. Since then, he is doing better. When the doctor saw him at this visit, the review system said that he was positive for malaise and fatigue, negative for fever, chills, and weight loss. Uh, mostly, he is on a wheelchair. He has blurred vision. You can see all of those things. Physical exam, nursing notes, and vital sign review. So that would be the medical assistance notes and the vital signs are reviewed. Um, he is oriented to person, place, time, and, and uh, he is well developed, well nourished, nourished, and has no distress. Um, he on a wheelchair. He is um, he's in a wheelchair and he has no distress. His speech is normal. He is on oxygen. Um, his his. Uh, Oral pharynx area is clear and moist. That's in his, his mouth and throat. His eyes are normal. Um, there's nothing listed on neck, and not no uh, no uh, not able to assess for uh, jugular vein distension as he is sitting up in the wheelchair during the exam. So basically, you're looking at what he says. His plan. Now he's telling you what's wrong with this patient here in order. Chronic kidney disease stage three with an episode of acute uh, uh, episode of AKI secondary to ischemic nef nephropathy and possibly hypertension. Um, secondary uh, hyperparathyroidism uh, of renal origin, so that's basically back to that kidney disease. Anemia from chronic kidney disease volume, and then it goes on. So, oops, sorry. Uh, addendum, um, hyperkalemia was, has resolved. So these are some additional things. Um, and so this is how we were going to diagnose him. Chronic kidney disease stage three, secondary hyperparathyroidism, hyper kidney, uh, hypertensive kidney disease with chronic kidney disease stage three, and congestive heart failure unspecified. So those were ICD-9 codes. Now these would be the ICD-10 codes based on his plan. So chronic kidney disease stage three is in 18.3. Secondary hyperparathyroidism is in 25.81. Hypertensive kidney disease with chronic kidney disease stage three, related to his blood pressure there, that's I12.9, and then congestive heart failure. Um, it, that should be I50, not 150, but it's I50.9. So you're, you see there that they have gone through and they have given you the appropriate ICD-10 codes. Now, here are the, the challenges. Congestive heart failure was mentioned in, the, um, in that, but how do we do based on the guidelines? So we're going to look at those things as we go along. We're going to try to be as specific as possible. Um, you have to sequence things based on what the doctor tells you. Um, it said anemia, but maybe there wasn't any... Um, and one of the things is that the anemia wasn't added to the diagnosis list. So we need to, we would need to go back and add that in because it is in the EMR. So we have to diagnose and we have to code for everything he says. Um, but are they sequenced appropriately? So uh, coding guidelines state that chronic conditions that are addressed during each encounter should be coded. Um, coding professionals should contact a provider. But if you're doing the coding, you've got to contact them about that congestive heart failure. Because it was mentioned, but he didn't put it in his plan. Um, so you just have to, so there's a lot of, of communication back and forth with the doctor. So once that is re resolved, the visit diagnosis encounter is gonna be like this. I-12.9 is gonna be first, then the chronic kidney disease, stage three, moderate, then a chronic systolic congestive heart failure, hyperparathyroidism, and the chronic anemia. 
because the hypertensive chronic kidney disease is what he was having trouble with during that visit, the diagnosis specific. The rest of that stuff he was being seen for were basically just follow up. Okay, so what happens when we don't failure to successfully implement ICD-10? It costs money. You don't get paid. Basically, you got to code correctly to get paid for what you're what they're there for. Um, payers do not accept anything but ICD-10 codes anymore. So you've got to know and you've got to follow along with that. Um, so there are opportunities. There's lots of opportunities related to your EHR training in your facility. Um, Basically, uh, IT will update that every October and every July. They'll, uh, IC, they'll, they should be updating ICD-10. Most facilities will do education for you every um, September and every June so that you know what's going on and what's changing because we know a little bit ahead what's going to change. Um, and always remember, if you have questions, if you're not sure what's going on, if you can't tell by a chart what diagnosis to choose, if you're the one having to choose that diagnosis, be sure you ask. Ask questions, ask questions, ask questions. Clear it up, clarify it, always clarify it. Don't guess because you're not the doctor. Oops, sorry. So how do we prepare? We look at ICD-10, we evaluate documentation requirements, and then we continually try to make improvements in our documentation to meet the guidelines based on what are passed down to us from um, Centers, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid every every year. All right, you guys, that's it for ICD-10 for now. We are going to um, look at, I'm going to actually make a video for you guys to show you what that ICD-10 looks like. It'll be on my overhead, so it's a little bit harder to, I can't project it up. Um, be sure that you have your top 50 diagnosis codes, your CPT codes, your DRGs, which, which would be diagnosis um, categories for hospital payment. Um, be sure that you have looked up um, your HCPCS codes as well, okay? All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.